it was October 7th, 1804. And as Joseph Musselman writes in his article on Lewis and Clark, out the mouth of the river we saw the tracks of the white bear, which was very large. Now this white bear is recorded in history wasn't actually a white bear, rather a grizzly bear. Naturally lighter in color than the brown bear or the black bear, typically, although they can vary in color from time to time. And this was the first evidence of the grizzly bear on their journey that they had encountered. And throughout their trip along the Missouri River westward to find this waterway to connect the Mississippi River and the Pacific Ocean, they encountered 43 different bears. And if you have any kind of knowledge of what to do when you encounter a bear in a wilderness or in uncharted territory or in your backyard, you know that when you encounter a bear, one thing you don't do is run. (laughs) You don't run. Although everything within you says, run, hide, get away, you don't run because you know that running triggers the predator instinct to give chase. I remember this very clearly when I was on my first bear hunt alone in eastern New Brunswick. I was 21 years old on the top of a mountain just before season began. I had driven my truck, my Ford Explorer, up this rugged, you know, uh, carved out dirt road all the way to the top of this mountain, found this little hole in the woods, and I had a tree stand there overlooking a bait pile because you can do that in Canada. And my plan was to entice bears to come into that area so I would have a nice easy shot. And as I was headed out there that morning, it was pre-season, I was getting ready, so I didn't have a firearm with me, nothing to protect myself with. The week before, I had dropped off some meat, hoping that would bring the bear in, but, you know, I know Yogi. And so this time, I brought some leftover bread and peanut butter and chocolate sauce. And I was on my way out there. And it was rather windy that day. And on my way out there, I decided that I was going to look for a stick to kind of mix the bait up with. And so I'm looking at the ground, looking at the ground, looking at the ground. When I look up, and from about me to that door away, this massive black head turns around with a mouthful of meat. It was a black bear. And I don't really remember the size of him at that point. Really, I thought, this is not good. (laughs) I am holding peanut butter and chocolate, dinner bell, anyone. (laughs) And I look at this bear, and everything inside of me is saying, don't move, don't move, don't move, don't move, because everything inside of me at the same time is simultaneously saying, you don't have a gun, you look tasty, get away. (laughs) And so I freeze, and I lock eyes with this beast until he turns his head around and goes back to eating, at which point I back away very, very, very slowly. And when I get behind the tree line, I run back, to my explorer at a very heightened pace. And when I get inside, I lock the doors because you never know. I mean, that just made me feel better. And I tell you, it's a funny feeling in those kinds of encounters. If you've ever been in one, when you know you should move, you have to move, you can't stay where you're at. And at the same time, you don't know how to move. It's those moments where we feel stuck. Moments like Lewis and Clark encountering on their uncharted journey off the map where they've come so far by canoe and now they're on the Rocky Mountains and they're looking across for miles saying, how do we move forward? Moments where we discover we, we can't stay as we are and yet we can't go forward as we have. And so last week we learned about the new cultural terrain of where we're at and how we're moving in this journey forward in this thing called life, a a VUCA journey. VUCA, if you remember, was an acronym for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And in a sense, that makes us feel stuck. What if we take the wrong turn? What if we make the wrong move? What if we say the wrong thing? And we can't move forward in confidence like we're staring at this bear not knowing what to do. Because things are changing. 
and we haven't been here before. I mean, it's post-COVID. We live in a a post-Christian world in which we're living and things are drastically different from what's behind us. The older you are, the more perspective perhaps that you have on that, but faster and faster, the cultural terrain is shifting and we are journeying off the map of which we know how to do life in into uncharted territories where we're wondering how to navigate as we encounter difficult situations or bears in our lives. Because you see, we're becoming, if you're not aware of this, we're becoming more and more and more pluralistic in our culture than, than we have ever been, meaning no longer do we adhere to one truth, no longer do we recognize truth, but if truth, if there is such a thing, it's relative. It's, it's found in a collective experience. More and more, we are more secular than we've ever been, meaning we're trying to live our lives without God or pretend as if He doesn't exist. Nowadays, meaning our purpose is really just kind of a matter of what you decide, your experience, and no one can tell us any different. And we've connected that to the early church believers of whom the apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, where we discovered followers of Jesus have been living in this way in the Roman context as they're subjugated and and isolated and looked down upon and alienated and disenfranchised and eventually persecuted under Roman emperors like that of Nero and Domitian. Again, that's, that's not reality for most of us. Most of us don't fear for our lives. Most of us, oh no, if they find out I'm a Christian, I'm going to go to jail. I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose my life. They're going to take away my house. I won't be able to buy food. But yet we still face troubles. We feel sta- still face uncertainty and, and hardship. Maybe not to the same capacity, but it's there. And although people were still coming to faith in Jesus Christ through preaching and baptizing and and discipling relationships, in this context, they were still struggling to move forward just as we are today. They still recognize, you know, we can't stay as we are because Jesus has changed our lives, right? He did things that no one else could do. The way he taught was with such authority. He predicted his death and resurrection, and then he did it. So it's, it's got to be true. Jesus, because of Jesus, everything is different now. We can't go forward as we have in the past because it's different. Again, like Lewis and Clark as they journeyed along the Missouri River looking for the West Coast. Things are changing. And so Peter, as we read in the Scriptures here, he's been focusing on our future hope until this point. But reality is, we must not lose sight of the present in light of the future. What Christ has done for us, as we're talking about last week, should affect how we live today. Eternity and the overwhelming thought of it should affect how we live each day and each moment. Because some Christians, you know, they take the position of, well, I'll just kind of hunker down and and wait until Christ returns. I'll just kind of get in my little church gathering, little family setting, and I'll just kind of learn about Jesus and follow Him and surrender my life to Him. And it'll just kind of be me and those around me, and I'll, I'll hunker down and I'll wait it out until Jesus comes back. Trouble is, Jesus didn't say do that. He said, go make disciples. Go, go tell the world about me. And so Peter, he, he gives some instruction to those who are feeling stuck. He's got some things to say about them as they navigate the new cultural terrain. Some encouragement and direction on how to move forward. And this is what we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. He starts with this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. And and if we pause, there's some really practical advice for a how-to in our journey forward of of our living in this specific context, in this specific time. And it's wrapped up in these words 
alert and, and sober. Peter encourages those who are struggling, who are living in difficulty, who are looking at the, the bear of Rome in the face. He's, he's saying, this is how you need to move forward. Journey on, alert and sober. When you're stuck, journey this way. The New Living Translation of the Bible says it like this. I like it. It says, so think clearly. Exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. I like, I like the way it says it there. I like the way the, the New King's James Version says it. It says it like this. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and you know, uh, of all of these texts and ways that the Bible interprets the, the, the Greek here, I, I, I think I like the way the King James and the old, in the old King James, you know, interpret it best because I love the images, imagery that's, that's tied with it, right? To gird up one's loins. I mean, that just sounds weird doesn't it? I mean, it's a loins. What are they, are they talking about? A tenderloin? Are they talking about a pork loin? I'm getting hungry. You guys ready for lunch, man? What are, what are they talking about? You see, in, in, in this time that the scripture was written, often men would wear like robes, long robes, not just in the morning, like when you were getting comfy or just at night, but, but long flowing robes down to their feet. And you know, when the walk was easy and the road was easy and the path was easy, and you didn't have to be anywhere in a rush, that was fine. But if somebody was chasing you or you came across some rough terrain or you had to go through a difficult area that required you to move quickly and unhindered and with ease, you would gird up your loins. You would tuck in your robe. You would pick it up and hike it up so you could be free to run. And you would tuck it in your belt or something like that. That's what this picture is. That's what it's talking about. You were ready for what was coming. The word sober here is the Greek word nepho. And it has two meanings. First, to be literally sober in the sense that you're not consuming too, many, uh, uh, too much alcohol. You're not getting high off drugs. You're not, you're not, uh, your, your mind's not being impaired by these things. And, and that's the, mo the typical one that people go to. But the one that we're not so much familiar with is this one that's often overlooked, and that's to be so intoxicated with the things of this world, either pleasures or fears, that it impairs our judgment. That we're unable to think about anything else. We're not able to focus on who Christ has called us to be and what he's called us to do, and if you're like me from time to time, you can wrestle with that tension in your own life where you're focused on other things besides what Jesus has done for you and what he's called you to do. You move away from like verses 3 to 12, which talk about all the love that God has for us and what he's done, and, and you become consumed with the things of this world. And they're not necessarily bad things. They're just things that draw your attention away from Jesus. And listen, anytime something draws your attention away from Jesus and isolates from you, him from you from him and, and your church family, that's not healthy. That's a bad thing. I've, I've been reflecting on this whole Uncharted series as we look at these images of mountains and trees and streams and rivers and those kinds of things. And it's got me thinking about the outdoors. It's got me thinking that deer season is like three or four months away. I mean, it is that close just the other day i was out in the woods during turkey season and i was looking for deer sign and i found some and i was really excited you know my heart started to pound and then i found a bear track and i was like oh buddy it's on now and i got really really exciting because because you guys you guys know how much i love hunting i can hardly make it through a sermon without talking don't make fun of me it's just who i am right i mean it's just reality Years ago, I remember there was a season where I, I, I didn't shoot a deer. I mean, I wanted to. I even prayed, God, please send me a deer. That morning, a little spike came through, and I said, God, it's not big enough. Send another one. That was the last deer I saw that season, right? 
So the next year when I went out opening morning, a deer came behind me, which was nice in size, but it was in the brush and I couldn't shoot it. But he kept looking at me like he could see me and I knew he couldn't and I knew I had scent cover on. And so when I turned my head ever so slowly to see what he was looking at, there in front of me was a nice buck, a spike. I didn't care this time. I thought that might be the only one I get to see. So I pulled back and boom, meat on the table. I wasn't hesitant. I was hungry. I had an itch that needed to be scratched. Next day, I went out again. That itch was still there. That intoxication of deer season was still there. One doe came in. I drew back on it. I spooked her. She ran away. Another one came through. I drew back. She spooked and ran away. Finally, the third doe came and whack, I let her have it. Meat on the table. (laughs) Tagged out in two days. Deer hunting and the thought of being successful at it was consuming me. In fact, later on in life, it became so intoxicating that I would miss date nights with my wife. Honey, we're going we're gonna to hold on tonight. Daddy's got an appointment or a date with a deer in the woods. You know, things would get scheduled with the kids like soccer games. And I was so intoxicated with deer hunting that I was just, you, you go with grandma to the soccer game this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head out to the woods. I have to schedule stuff for ministry, events and stuff like that. I'd try to figure out how to schedule them outside of a Saturday. I remember one time I sent my kids off to an event and I said, I'll meet you there a little bit later in the morning. I was being consumed. I was intoxicated with, with being in the woods to the point where it was affecting my judgment, making me seem like spiritual things and presence of God and gathering with my my family of believers and ministering to them, it wasn't as important as my success in the outdoors. I was making all my decisions around the question of how do I keep life and ministry from interfering with my deer season because I was intoxicated with it. And I got to tell you, friends, this is what Peter is concerned about. This is what he's concerned about as he writes to the early church, headed into this uncharted territory. He's telling them on this journey, we can't have these things weighing us down. We've got to be ready. We've got to gird up our loins. We can't have anything inhibiting us or or tempting us or, or the tension between us and God from all that Jesus has done and wants to do through us. We don't want to allow ourselves to be intoxicated by the things of this present world. We have to be ready, alert, sober-minded, because later on Peter will say, our enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. We've got to be sober-minded, clear-minded, self-controlled as his followers, because when we're intoxicated and consumed by the things of this world, we miss out on the fullness of joy. We miss out on the lasting and abundant joy that can only be found in a relationship with Jesus and the purpose to which he's called us. The Roman culture of which within the early church existed, this was one without restraint, where they pursued sexual relationships like crazy. I mean, there's people that have been written that have had like 20 plus wives or husbands because they couldn't control this indulgence. They ran rampant with with drunkenness and parties and other things that I don't care to mention this morning. But the pleasure of this life consumed people to the point where the only purpose they had was in the pleasures that they could experience the here and now. And I guess as I think about that and and Peter's call and his instructions as we journey forward and as we navigate to to be of clear mind and and sober and self-controlled, I think, are there things in my life, are there things in our lives that we're intoxicated with? that we are so focused on, that they consume our minds and maybe even uh, time to the point where our readiness and availability to live for God and in His grace in the moment and and to be ready for Him, that's inhibited. We're consumed by the pleasures and the fun in this world. Not that fun is bad. I love having fun, but we're concerned to the point that it affects our relationship with God. It affects our relationship with the church. We're too busy. We've got other things that we want to do. My friends, that's not a healthy place to be. It's not how we move forward. 
And if that's the case, and maybe we're thinking something right now that's a little too much of a priority, be that a relationship, a substance, a particular activity or behavior that maybe no one else knows about, I would encourage us, as we look at that bear, don't stay stuck. Don't stay stuck. Because God has so much more for you. Don't run away. God has so much more for you to look forward to. The scripture says in verse 13, set your hope on God's grace. Make him the pursuit of your life. Make him the pursuit of our lives. And that starts with admission. That starts with saying, God, I have a problem. And I need your help fixing it. And God is awesome because he's given us each other to help us, to walk with us. In fact, just the other day, I sought out an accountability partner. I called up a friend of mine and I said, hey man, I'm sensing the Lord leading me this way. And it's not necessarily things that I shouldn't be doing. It's things that I need to be doing. You know, I need to figure out how to be a better husband. I need to figure out how to be a a better dad to my kids. I I need to, to figure out how to how to go and make sure that I'm seeking out places where people don't know about Jesus. And so hold me accountable in those things because I want to foster and build those kind of relationships. And, you know, maybe you're in the same place, whether it's something that you should be doing or something that you shouldn't be doing. Listen, God doesn't want us to journey alone. It was Lewis and Clark, (laughs) and then a whole company (laughs) as well. But it wasn't just one of them journeying alone. And I want you to know today, you don't have to journey alone. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're facing, you can seek out accountability with a brother or a sister in Christ who is there to help you. Because if we're going to make it on this journey, we need each other. We need to be prepared. We're going to want to be ready. We're going to have those loins girded up. Don't picture that. We're going to be self-controlled. We're going to be alert. Which brings us to verse 14, our next piece of advice given by Peter to the early church. People scattered across the changing Roman cultural terrain. He says, he says this, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it's written, be holy because I am holy. And this is a direct quote from Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, when God tells Moses uh, to tell Israel, God's chosen people at that time, to consecrate themselves or set themselves apart for him and his purposes to redeem and re- restore the, the whole world. And, and maybe you remember the story of Moses in the Old Testament. They've made numerous movies about it where he's walking along in the wilderness as a shepherd and he comes across this burning bush that won't be burned up. And he gets to the bush and he's like, ah, a burning bush. This is amazing. No, he hears God's voice speak to him. Moses, Moses, take off your sandals for the place you're standing is what? Is holy ground. It's holy ground. And the word holy here is the Greek word hagios, which obviously if you've grown up in the church or even not, has a whole bunch of nuances connected with it, tied to it. Legalism. There was a time in the church when, you know, your pants had to be so long and you could only wear dresses and you couldn't have earrings and, you know, there was all these different legalistic rules and kinds of things. Maybe they were meant for a good purpose, but, but we missed out on what God was really calling us to. Maybe those are things that come up in your mind. Maybe that's your experience with holiness. It's following the rules. But listen, because the word carries with it here a picture that we need to get in our mind. Maybe it's a picture that we've never heard before. But it's a picture of all our reverence and the idea is that we live in such a way that day by day and moment by moment we recognize that we're in the presence of God. We recognize that we're like Moses. We're living in the literal presence of God. There is something unique and distinct about how we act because of it. How we live and recognize not only where we are, but where we are and where we're going. There's a very real sense that God is with us right now in a very, a very real sense that we're going to be with him later on down the road. If you read the Gospels and you look at the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is how Jesus lived. 
he had this constant communion with the Father. He journeyed through life. What time he was here in the presence of God, which means in this uncharted cultural terrain, like Peter says here in a roundabout way, we need to strive to be like Christ in this capacity. Live as if we are in the very presence of God. The word used here again is obedient children. And maybe that makes you feel a little bit belittled, right? Now be obedient, Timmy. I told you. Obedient children, right? Not meaning of low value or minimal of importance, but rather children. Implying of most importance and great value. Children of God who embrace their heritage, who are aware of whose they are. And what a great privilege and responsibility that comes with it. I knew a a, a man one time who worked at a car dealership, a Christian man. He was a friend of mine. And uh, he had to go into work ridiculously early. If if you work at a dealership or you've ever worked at a dealership, you know they start the day very early. And he had at his heart one time to, to reach out to his coworkers and help them grow in their faith. And so he started a Bible study. One day of the week, they would meet early. They would come in before work, and they would have a Bible study, and they would grow in their relationships, and, and you know, people started getting saved, and it was a wonderful ministry, wonderful thing, as people came and realized they were in the presence of God. And I remember him telling a story uh, to me one time about a friend of his that he was riding along with in the car one day, and he let some colorful language go. Just some, some interesting choice of words that you know, some would say, well, that's not words that Christians would usually use. And uh, so as they were driving along, curious, he wasn't offended by it or anything. He was just curious. And he said, you know, Jerry, that wasn't his real name. He said, Jerry, I've known you for quite a while now. And I, I know you enough to, to at least think that if a child or a lady were present, that you would choose some different words to be using right now. You, you wouldn't be using those words Am I right on that? And Jerry said, yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't use those words in front of a a child or a lady. And he said, would you use those words if God were here with us right now? He said, oh, no, no, I wouldn't. He said, well, you know that God is, is present here with us right now. His Holy Spirit lives in us. He's present. He said, oh. I never thought about it like that before. And friends, honestly, I'm not here to debate, you know, which words are culturally acceptable and which words are offensive and which words we shouldn't and shouldn't use. I trust the Holy Spirit will speak to you on that. But the point is, is that when we live as if we are in the presence of God, it affects our behavior. It affects our speech. It affects how we spend our time, our pursuits, how we treat other people, our family, our neighbors, and just about everything and anything else we can think of. I mean, if, if the living God of the universe was coming to stay with you for a week, starting tomorrow, how might that affect your schedule? How might that affect how you speak to other people? How might that affect, you know, what you put in front of your eyes or what you listen to? Are there things about your life that would change? Such was the practice of a Carmelite monk in 17th century France by the name of Brother Lawrence. Right? His tasks were filled with rather dull, mindless duties. One day he decided to approach every mindless task, every repetitive thing that he had to do, as, as if he were going to invite God to be part of that and do it with him. So when he was sweeping the floor, he would remind himself, I'm in the presence of God. And he would have a conversation with him. Or he would think about him. Or he would worship him. When he was folding his clothes, that's what he would do. When he was scrubbing pots and cleaning the kitchen, that's what he was doing. Reminding himself constantly, moment by moment, that he was in the presence of God and God was right there with him. And at the end of that experience, he said practicing the presence of God is a life that is filled with intimacy and joy. Friends, as we journey through this new cultural terrain, much like the early church, and we're tempted with earthly pursuits and pleasures, whatever that might look like. Might Peter's words here be of utmost importance, the call to encouragement uh, to live 
as if we are in the very presence of God. To be holy because he is holy. And I actually think that might help with the bears that we come across in our life. With those things that make us scared or intimidated or the tension that creates in our relationship with God and with others or in our jobs or where we feel stuck in our health. Because listen, in God's presence, there is peace. There is love. There is joy. There is courage. There is abundance. There is freedom. I would challenge us to live or take on the perspective of Brother Lawrence and practice the presence of God every day and everywhere, being mindful that he is with you. There there is no separation between the secular and the sacred. God is ever present. We'll move on to verse 17 here with me because we see one more thing about journeying off the map or in uncharted territory that is beneficial for those who follow Jesus. And it's a lot to unpack here. It's where Scripture says, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. It's not about following the rules. You can't be good enough or give enough to have a right relationship with God. Rather, it was with precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God it's not through your heritage it's not because you're Jewish that you're saved it's because you've been born again for all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field the grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of the Lord endures forever and this is the word that was preached to you I feel like we could do a whole series on just that one little passage there. There is obviously a lot to reflect on. Understanding that God will judge our works or acts or how we live and he will do it justly. Giving us a sense that how we live right now matters. We're gonna have to give account for our lives before a holy God. Understanding that, that when God created the world perfectly and we messed it up, He didn't say, oh no, what am I going to do when Jesus was plan B? No, Scripture tells us that Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world, understanding that God's Word is enduring and eternal, and it doesn't change. Maybe we could do a series on that. It's the standard for life and authoritative for how we live in abundance and forever. We could focus on all of those things, and all of those things are good to focus on, and we'll probably do that at some point. But what I'm really drawn to here, where I really sense God leading us this morning, where I sense the Holy Spirit drawing us this morning, is is these words. So that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. So that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. And I highlight this because in this season, at this specific time, as we journey into the unknown, as life is changing rapidly and we can't even keep up with the news and what's going on anymore and all these tragedies are happening and tension and politics and everything, we need to love each other. We need to love each other. We need to be motivated by love because let me tell you what, love will make you do crazy things. An outrageous love for God will make you do things you wouldn't ordinarily do. Maddie, when when she was two years old, she liked to play hide-and-seek. Y'all like to play hide-and-seek? Maddie liked to play hide-and-seek. She liked to play without telling us that she was playing hide-and-seek. So we'd be watching TV or 
or, or we'd be cooking dinner or something like that, sitting on the couch, wondering where Maddie was, because it'd get really quiet. And that's how parents know something's going wrong. They can't hear anything, right? It's too quiet. So we'd get up around the house, and we'd go looking for Maddie. Maddie, Maddie, where are you? Upstairs, downstairs, kitchen, living room. We'd look for her. Not a peep. She wouldn't answer us. And we'd look in her closet, and under the stuffed animals, we'd find her. Or hidden underneath her crib. She'd be tucked away in there. This big old grin on her face. Then we moved to South Carolina and we lived with Paul and Susan. And the house got a whole lot bigger. (laughs) There were a whole lot more rooms. And we lived by a lake. And I remember one time we were staying there and it got really quiet. And where's Maddie? I don't know. I thought she was with you. No, I thought she was with you. And so we're running around the house and we're looking for Maddie. Maddie, where are you? And then we bend down the lake, so we're wondering, maybe she went down by the lake because the kids were playing outside. So we go outside, and we're looking all down the lake. Maddie, Maddie, where are you? And we go inside, and we're down in the basin. Maddie, where are you? We can't find her, and suddenly we're starting to panic. And then we go in the sewing room, and behind the chair in the corner, there's Maddie tucked away with this silly little grin on her face. I'm like, Maddie, you can't do it. You can't do this to us. You can't hide like this. You have to tell us where you are at. Tell us you're playing hide and seek. And came the day where we went into Walmart. And she got in the center of one of those little clothes racks. And where's Maddie? We can't find her. We're looking all over. And you know the stories about trafficking and all those kinds of things. And they enter our minds. And suddenly we begin calling out louder and louder, Maddie, Maddie, where are you? And people are starting to look at us like we're weird or crazy. Or something's wrong and they don't know what to do. Maddie, Maddie, we're running to the store. Maddie, where are you? We can't find you, and we're looking, and we're looking. We don't care how we look at this point. We don't care if we're creating a disturbance. We we don't care if, oh, those are bad parents. They can't even find their kids. We don't care at this point. We love Maddie. we got to find Maddie with everything in us. We are looking for her because we love her. She comes out of that clothes rack, and we have a long, long talk. Love will make you do crazy things. In a similar way, this is what God's love does to us and for us. He loved us so much that before the creation of the world, when he knew what was going to happen, he didn't just go, not going with that one. You know what they're going to do later? Mm Mm-hmm. Sorry. (laughs) No, before the creation of the world, he said, son got a plan you're gonna help us stay in relationship with these people who are created in our image and Jesus says you bet dad we're going after him the same Jesus who said love each other as I have loved you and what's interesting here about this word love in this passage is although it's the same English word love in Greek it's two different words First being Philadelphia. Yes, I just said Philadelphia in a fancy way. (laughs) So if you can say Philadelphia, you can speak Greek. And it, it it means like familial love, brotherly love or sisterly love. And the second word for love here is is a different kind of love. It's a kapo. It's it's a it's a moral love, it's a benevolent love, it's a giving love, love that sees your fellow. Christian in need and does something about it. It's a love that requires effort and endurance. And in the church, it's often associated with the characteristics of prayer, of fervency and consistency and effort. William Barclay, one of my favorite commentators, tells us the church is to be filled with people who love one another, who try to understand one another, give the other person the benefit of the doubt. The church is to be filled with people who overlook the offense that happened against them. Friends, is this the kind of love that we have for one another that says, I know you drive me nuts, but I'm going to love you anyway. The kind of love that, that says, you really get on my nerves. You know what? I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to love you anyway. The 
kind of love that says, you hurt me when you did that or when you said that. You know what? I'm not even going to point it out because I love you. And I know you didn't mean it that way. I'm going to love you anyway. Because the scriptures tell us that love covers a multitude of sins. It's willing to work through or overlook an offense. And, and I don't know, friends, this morning, I've been going on for a little bit here. Maybe some of these things sound a bit difficult or hard for us to embrace. Maybe we don't want to be alert and sober because we're enjoying the things this life has to offer. And we don't want to concern ourselves with the new cultural terrain or how things are changing. We're just going to you know, do life how he's always done it. We're going we're gonna to forget about it. Maybe we're afraid to let go because, you know, we don't know if God can fill us with satisfaction the way that activity or substance or, you know, relationship fills us. We don't, we don't trust Jesus enough to, to fill that hurt or void. Or maybe, maybe we don't want to practice the presence of God. Maybe we don't want to strive to live like Christ and pursue holiness because you know, what if we'll mess up? And we hate letting people down. We hate letting God down and we've made commitment after commitment after commitment and God is going to be different. It's going to change. And we're tired of making commitments. We're tired of living differently because, man, it just never seems to be reality. And so instead, we're just going to kind of coast. We're going to fly under the radar. So we don't have to worry. Or maybe, maybe somebody has hurt us. Maybe even somebody in our church, somebody in our family, and you know, loving them, forgiving them, oh, it just hurts too much. I don't know if I can do that. We're just not interested in that. Now, it may, maybe one or two of them, or even all of these things are reality. And they're, and they're difficult. And we're stuck. We're unable to move forward. It's like we're looking at this bear, and we don't know whether to run or, or what. We're unable to move forward. We've been on this journey and now we're looking out and we don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. Perhaps that's how the disciples felt in that room, closed all the doors and windows. And they're praying and they can hear the people outside and they know the culture that they're living in. Jesus told us to go make disciples, but they just killed them. I don't want to get killed. And Philip leans over to Peter and he says, Hey, Pete, what do we do? He says, I don't know, Phil. Let's just do what Jesus told us. Let's just keep praying. Let's keep praying. Things are different now. Jesus told us to wait and to pray. And suddenly in the darkness, in the insecurity, in the ambiguousness, in the, in the complexity, whoosh! A window flies open and there's a rushing wind in the room and their faces starting to bright and they're glowing and it's like they're on fire in fact they can see it above one another's heads and they run out the doors and into the streets and they start talking to people and although everybody's in a different language they can understand each other and they're saying let me tell you about my Jesus let me tell you about he changes lives. I want that in my heart. I'm looking at the cultural terrain around us. I don't know how to talk to people. Sometimes I don't know what to say. Am I going to offend somebody? How do I begin this conversation? How do I enter into that place? How do I get down in the mess? And I don't know how to do it. I say, Jesus, I need a touch from you. I need your Holy Spirit to invade my life because there's things I need to let go of. There's things I need to put to death so that you can take up residence in my heart and in my soul. God, I need to, I need to recognize that I'm in your presence every day and I need to live differently because there's a host of people that I need to love. And I need to love them fiercely. My friends, this is Pentecost Sunday. 
This is the day we celebrate and recognize the Holy Spirit coming into that room and lighting things up. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of living in the dark. I'm tired of watching my neighbors live in the dark. And I'm tired of pursuing things that aren't of God and that hold me bondage and keep me from where I want to be. And I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with His presence from the tips of my toes to the top of my head. And I don't just want it for me. I want it for everyone. I want it for all of us. And so this morning, we're just going to simply be like the people in that upper room. And we're just going to pray and we're going to ask for God's presence to come. And if you want to stand to do that, do that. If you want to turn around and kneel at your seat, do that. If you want to come forward here and stand in the front, do that. Don't let fear, don't let intimidation, don't let what somebody else thinks affect how you cry out for God's presence. If you want his presence in your life in a new and a fresh way that you haven't experienced before, I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to invite you to worship and posture yourselves before the King of Kings and invite him to fill you in a new and refreshing way this morning.